And then there's like, and there's a fan, and there's another light you flip on, and you can feel the heat hit your face as you sit down using the bathroom. These lights are like those lights. So if you see me drip, drip a little bit, <laughs> that's why. Let me put this phone behind me. <laughs> um, I'm going to pray one more time with you guys, if that's all right. We, I know we pray a lot. Um, if you're visiting, we believe prayer is a big thing. Bold prayers honor God because they do God honors them. Um, let's pray one more time. God, thank you for today. Thank you for every single person in this room. Thank you for family. Thank you for new family in Jesus. Um, thank you for all that you have done in all of our lives. And we pray that today we would get um, just a little bit of your word through your scripture and just reflect a little bit on what you have done and what you are doing and what you are up to in the world. I would pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, somebody get grab my phone for me. You got, oh, I got it in my pocket. You're good. You're good. You're about to have a sermon. That's what. That's the disadvantage of electronic preaching. Okay, so. Uh, today, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, new wine. There's a verse in your Bibles that talks about new wine. And everything I, I, I talk about will be up on the screen, but if you're following along, you can turn to Matthew 9.17. We're just going to read it real quick. This isn't our main scripture. We're going to be looking through. I'm going to pop all around. I know I don't do that normally. I do one little thing and stay on it. But um, it says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wine skins, and both are preserved. A little bit of background on that really quick. If you grew up like me with Nalgene bottles and BPA in your plastic, and you never had to worry about sticking your liquid in animal skins or anything like that, but when you would put fermented wine in a wine skin that was made of animal skin or goat skin or whatever animal that shows, the fermented wine would stretch the skin that it was put in and it would get further and further and further. And so it says there in Matthew 9, 17, that obviously for their day and their time then, no one would ever put new wine into a nasty old wine skin. It would be like going to pig to the pigwig and grabbing your jug of milk and pouring it into your nasty old jug of milk that you've left outside for a while and swishing it around and then making a bowl of cereal with it and eating it. It would be weird and gross and nasty and no one wants to do that. So, that being said, first, I want to talk to you guys about Jimmy and his Jeep Wrangler. Just a little bit. Um, I'm going to pause for a sec and find what I want to talk to you about. But, um, um, how many, raise your hand if you ever sold anything on Craigslist? Nobody. <laughs> okay, good. You're not this dangerous, don't do it. <laughs> um, I want you to pretend for a second that you have a 2002 Jeep Wrangler. It's beautiful and you love it and it's your baby, but now you're trying to afford one of those fancy new Toyota Corollas that you have heard so much about and it has a nice little backup camera and a cool little Bluetooth and you can hook up your iPod to it to call your friends and your regular isn't as cool as it once was and sometimes it breaks down and your friends don't care that you call her Maggie. They make fun of you because it's breaking down. So you decide that you want to sell your 2002 metallic silver Jeep Wrangler and you post it on Craigslist. A couple days later, you receive a call from a man named Jimmy who's interested in seeing your Jeep. He thought it looked pretty neat, and, he, and he, you're excited because you've been wanting to get rid of it for a while, again, so you can afford one of those fancy, new, spangled Toyota Corollas. And so he comes to your house, he tells him to come on by, and after talking for a bit, he asks if he can see your car. You begin to hand Jimmy the keys to your car, but as he's walking up to your door, you realize you don't see his car. And it's 2018, and times just aren't like they used to be. So you ask him where his car is. Around the corner, he says. Fair enough. You give him the keys, and Jimmy drives off. You grab your favorite copy of Outdoor Magazine, and you sit on the front steps of your 
uh, house and you begin to read it and you just flip through. Or if you're um, younger than 35, then you just scroll through Instagram mindlessly and look at what other people's lives are doing and uh, like all their, their pictures. But it, you, you do that for a few minutes and then a few more minutes and then a few more minutes and a few more minutes. And after a while, 30 minutes have gone by and you just think Jimmy is a fairly thorough guy. He's just checking out, you know, he's just taking it for a spin. He, he ain't drove a stick in a while. He just needs to, you know, get going with it. And after about an hour, you say, he just must be really thorough. He probably took it to uh, an automotive, he probably took it to Colt's place. And he's getting Colt to look at it so uh, he can make sure that I'm not ripping him off. And that it's, it's exactly what it needs to be. Then another hour goes by. After two hours, you're convinced that Jimmy has stolen your 2002 metallic silver Jeep Wrangler. So what do you do? Call the police. Call the police, right? I hope you call the police or just, you know, write it off. Call the police. Mm -hmm. Of course you do. Look at your neighbor and say, call the police. Call the police. Of course you call the police. But at the same time, how weird is it that when our, our natural instinct when something is stolen is to pick up a phone and call someone who will, within minutes, dispatch an entire team of experts to go out and to look for your car. A few hours go by, and wow, they actually found him. You never thought that would happen. The officer comes back to your house, and he is now telling you the story as he returns to the car and explains that they found Jimmy walking out of the Circle K a few miles down the road with a strawberry air freshener and a bag of cheese bits as he comes out of the local Circle K. And when they confronted him about stealing your car, Jimmy said, what do you mean? I didn't steal his car. That nice man gave me the keys. He just handed them to me. And let me go off. And you say, what? He didn't give me any money first. And the officer tells you that when he explained to Jimmy that you have to give someone money before you just take their car, he replied, I've never heard of that before. What a great idea. <laughs> you find this story strange, right? It doesn't make sense because that's not how the world works. Because you have a sense where we live in our day and our time of how business works. Two parties agree to trade something, and then you, if you fail to do your part, then there are legal consequences. Whether you're buying houses, trading horses, or buying a Red Bull from your local kangaroo, there is a system of law and justice that punishes people for not upholding their end of the deal. Dylan, no matter how bad he wants to eat a family-sized bag of Doritos when he has no money, cannot do it unless he goes into Walmart with $3.97, which is $2 too much if you ask me, and buys it and eats it after I pay him. Now, a question. 4,000 years ago in human history, what did people do when someone failed to uphold their end of the deal? What did people do when Jimmy ran off with their goat? What police did they call? What people did they talk to? What did they do? Which leads to another question. Before there were elaborate structures of justice like we have now, how did people even trust each other? And another, how did business get done if there was no one to call anyway when someone didn't uphold their end of the bargain? These are the kind of questions that we want to ask when we read our Bible, what were things like then in their day, and how does that make things look for us now in our day? One answer, covenant. There was something that people would do about 4,000 years ago that was covenant, and they would get animals. And first, they would grab an animal, I don't know which animal, maybe a goat, or a heifer, or a baby dove. Sad, you don't know what's about to happen yet. And they cut it in half. And they would cut the animals in half, and they would spread both animal halves uh, on either side of them. And they would both stand at either end of the animal halves. And then as Dylan and Jimmy, on the other side of the animal halves, walked through the two halves of the animals divided, we would say something like, may I become like these animals if I fail to uphold my end 
of the covenant. So, the answer to the question then, what did people do when there were no elaborate systems of justice and law and things to keep them in check? They walked through an animal house and said they were going to cut each other up <laughs> if they didn't do it right. Or someone else in the village would do it. I will give you one 2002 metallic silver Jeep Wrangler in uh, with an ominous rattle once it gets just above 63 miles per hour. Jimmy, I will give you $1,473 for the privilege of owning such a majestic vehicle. So you walk between the animal halves and you say that. Do you see the power in a covenant like this? Do you see the point where in earlier cultures, where a system of justice was more primitive, your word was your bond. Oh, that's good. I know that. That's the that's country coming out of me. I never learned that in Kingston. This was how society held together. By the way, this is where the phrase to cut a deal first came from. If you've ever said to someone, we're going to cut a deal. And all of this together leads us in our Bibles to Genesis 15, where we see God making grand promises to this guy named Abram, who would later be named Abraham. Maybe you've heard of him because Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. And it leads us all the way to there. And seeing as he's 99 years old, at the point when we pick up in Scripture that we're about to read, Abraham is having trouble believing God when he says he's going to have a lot of babies. I would too. I don't know how many of you are close to 99, but if God came down and said, hey, you're going to have a bunch of babies, you'd be like, uh, I don't know, but are you sure? I don't, I, maybe you wouldn't even want it, but Abraham did. And so God, we're going to see what he does. Um, Genesis 15.5. If you have your Bibles, it's Genesis 15.5. And in Genesis 15, 5, God takes Abraham outside in the middle of his worries, in the middle of his struggle, in the middle of his pain. He takes Abraham outside and he says, look at the sky and count the stars, if you were even able to count them. And then he said to them, your offspring will be that numerous. Believe me, if you're in this room and you've ever... Um, struggle with wanting to have a child and um, having been through the struggle of, of not being able to right away or not being able to at all, at all. You know how massive of a promise this was to Abram. And in the next verse, something really special happened. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abram believed the Lord and credited it to him as righteousness. Turn to your neighbor and say, Righteousness. Turn to your other neighbor and say, Old oh, snap. Oh, snap. Something's about to happen. Genesis 15, 8. But he says, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? How can I know that your promises are true? How can I know that what you say is really going to happen? Look at your neighbor and say, You got to cut a deal. <laughs> he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So we brought all these to him, cut them in half, and laid the pieces opposite each other. But he didn't cut the birds in half. Birds of prey came down in the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram, and suddenly great terror and darkness descended on him. Now that you know the background to this story, now that you know about Jimmy and his Jeep Wrangler that he wants to buy from you, that he maybe or maybe not have stolen from you, now that you know what cutting a deal is, now you can read this story the way that the people then in their day would have heard it as they sat around a fire and heard it told the same time. When it first, when God first said, go get the animals, the people said, oh, he's about to make a deal. They didn't just say he's about to get some animals. They said he's about to cut a deal. And so then, in Genesis 15, 17, Abram wakes up, and it says, when the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. 
Um, if you're in here and you haven't been able to read the Bible a whole lot or you're a little new to Scripture, you're a little new to following Jesus or just exploring the whole God thing, then in the Old Testament you should know that whenever something has to do with fire comes up, it signifies the presence of the Lord. So now, a question for you all. As the audience in 2018 listening to the story from 4,500 years ago, when God says, Abram, we're going to cut a deal. And he puts the animal halves in half, and they both stand on either side, and then the presence of the Lord was in this fire pot, in a smoking fire pot, and it says the fire pot passed through, the flaming torch appeared, and passed between the divided animals. Story over. But wait a minute. Aren't both people supposed to pass through the animal halves when you cut a deal? Don't both people have to uphold their end of the bargain? The people who heard this story then, in their day, would have understood it immediately. God was up to a new thing in human history. This time, God was going to uphold both ends of the bargain all by himself. Even when Abram makes a mess of things, yes. Even when he's not perfect, yes. Even when he messes up every step of the way in his life, Yes, God was going to uphold both ends of the deal. One more scripture for today. Take a Bible and turn to Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. It's Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. Um, I'm going to just start reading it. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. That he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring unity to all things together in Christ Jesus, both things in heaven and things on earth. Yeah. 
there was none of it. And then something happened that we call the fall. In the fall, people chose to rebel against the king of the universe in a cosmic rebellion. And they turned their face away from him and said, hey, I want to do things my own way. If you're in this room, maybe you follow Jesus for a while and you've been told that you are a victim of the sin of Adam and Eve. You're not. You are a willing participant in their sin. Every single day that we wake up, we willingly do it. And we would have chosen the same thing. The reason the world is the way it is is not because two people at one point in human history messed up. It's because all of us every day mess up and choose to rebel against God. We are active participants in ourselves. So here's what we do. Here's what we do sometimes. If you're here and not committed to the whole Jesus thing, I'm willing to bet you've done this because I did this for years. This is what we do, all right? We put ourselves on a scale and we say, Hitler, he's here. He's definitely going to hell. Hitler ain't making it to heaven. Joseph Stalin, all the real bad guys. That, that one guy that tripped you in middle school, they're all going to hell. They're the bad people, right? And then we say, but there's the really good people. Mother Teresa and Pastor Lewis. Now, maybe you're a priest, maybe you're a puppet, maybe you're a puppet, maybe you're a mom, maybe you're a grandma. They're the good people. They're amazing. For sure, they're going to heaven. So maybe, if I'm lucky enough, maybe if I walk enough sweet little ladies across the road and I give enough of my money to a church or I'm religious enough or I sing enough music or I believe just the right things, then maybe, just maybe, God will let me go into heaven like those good people. But the problem with putting yourself on a scale is that the scale is not you and the best and worst people in the world. The scale is you God and stacked up against God and His infinite holiness and perfection, you never, ever could match up to it. The tiniest thing you've done falls incredibly short of perfection. From the time that we were young, the smallest things we did fall short of perfection. What does this mean? All your good deeds you ever do in your entire life will never, ever outweigh your sin. You cannot be good enough to make up for the bad things that you have done. You are lost and broken. And you cannot be good enough. No one is good. The Bible says no, not one person. This is a word we read in the Old Testament a little while ago. Righteous. It's a churchy word. It sounds kind of weird. But it basically just means good. And God's standard, no one meets it. Not your mom. Not your dad. Not your sister. Not even your sweet grandma. Sorry, grandmas. That sweet grandma who you love, she was 16 years old once like you. She made a lot of mistakes like you. There was a song that played at my grandma, my best friend in my entire life at her funeral. It was Amazing Grace. Maybe you've heard it. And it says, Amazing Grace that's uh, saved a wretch like me. And I wasn't in church yet. And I remember talking to my dad and us talking to each other when I was in, I was like 11. And I, we were upset because we said, I called her Nanny. We said, Nanny was not a wretch. She was the greatest person that I've ever known. She never saw me once without saying, I love you, precious. She was the greatest human being that I've ever known in my entire life. But if you stack up my grandma, Nanny, against the perfect God of the universe and every sin that she's ever committed, she falls short. She was not good. According to God, in comparison to God, she was a wretch. But that's just half of the story. Here's the gospel, basically, in one sentence, four words. Jesus in my place. It's a marriage. It's not just, okay, Jesus did something for me, like if your friend, like, jumped in front of a car for you. Yes, that's great and amazing. They sacrificed their life for you. But this is so much more. When you get married, what happens? I'm looking forward to this one day because I have a lot of student loans. When you marry someone, what was once yours becomes theirs, and what is theirs becomes yours. So when Jesus died on the cross for you, what was once ours became his, and what was once his became ours. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just take your place, he gave you his place. He didn't just do something for you, he literally became you. Jesus didn't just die for you, he died as you on the cross, so that you never would have to. The Bible says that when God looks at you, he sees you as Jesus, not as you, a messed up sinner, but he's like, oh, I kind of forgive him or her anyway. The Bible 
Bible says that when Jesus died, he died as you, so you never have to. He took your place and gave you his. The Bible says that when God looks at your sins, he intentionally chooses now to shield his eyes from them and look back so he never sees them. It's as if you are perfect. It is as if you are righteousness. His righteousness became ours. Today is not about Michael and it's not about me. Today is about Jesus because Jesus is alive and that means that you don't have to be dead anymore. Abraham, in the story that we read, believed 4,500 years ago that God was going to do what he said he did, what he said he was going to do. And the Bible says that it credited it to Abraham as righteousness. Today, 6,000 years later or so, all you have to do, all you have to do, you don't have to believe what God says he's going to do anymore because he's done. You just have to believe what God has already done. And he will credit it to you as righteousness. He is still upholding both ends of the deal. He's cutting a second deal with us again. And this time, he's upholding both ends of the bargain forever. It's not temporary this time. It won't go away. It doesn't matter that she did something tonight or the next night when I was a kid. I used to wonder what happens if I lie to my mom and I die in a car wreck. Or I commit a sin, and then something happens, and a criminal comes in and hurts me, and I'm dead. And what happens? How do I know for sure that if I die, that I'm good? Jesus said he's cutting a second deal with us this time, and this time it is forever. It cannot go away. Nothing can take it from you. The Bible says, "Listen." Okay. And just so you know, maybe you grew up in the South, maybe you didn't grow up in the South, maybe you, this is weird for you. You're not familiar to the whole church thing. It is. I feel you. We say some weird things. We sang a hymn one time that talked about washing ourselves in the blood of the Lamb. And I was thinking about my atheist friends came in and heard that. They would need a long explanation about it. But um, there's no prayer that saves you. There is no prayer that will save you, number one. Number two, water cannot save you. You being baptized when you were five months old or one year old or two years old or three or when you were 13 did not save you. Jesus did. Number four, your tears cannot save you. Your sorrow cannot save you. You feeling bad for the things that you've done cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Not Jesus plus trying hard enough. Not Jesus plus being good enough. Not Jesus plus believing perfectly. Not Jesus plus attending the right church for the right amount of days and singing the right songs. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Full assurance that forever you are guaranteed a spot in his kingdom forever because when he died for you, he didn't die for you so that you have to live worried and come up every single week to the altar praying over and over to be saved again because you committed a sin this week. He died for you forever. He gave you his place forever. And if you want his place, all you have to do believe that Jesus Christ actually came to earth. He's a historical figure. There are more New Testament manuscripts of our Bible that are historically reliable than we have documents that the Civil War even happened. It's real. There were over 500 eyewitnesses after the resurrection of Jesus. Most of them were not Christian and did not believe in him and watched him rise from the dead and couldn't explain it and didn't believe it, but they, but they saw him. People stuck their fingers to the holes in his hands it doesn't even stack up and once you believe Jesus is real you just have to believe that he loves you enough that he's going to uphold both of us you have to believe that he loves you enough that he is going to uphold both ends of the deal and that he wants to give you his place and the Bible says if you have faith in that you are saved forever do me a favor I've never done this before in here but close your eyes every single person um, this is a super fantastic thing I promised myself I'd never do it but I'm going to do it keep your eyes closed everybody 